Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Crossover. Starring Josh Johnson and Chris McGill. Featuring Christina Thorson. And of course, you, the Instagram live chat. Now, sit back and enjoy this week's edition of The Crossover. Powered by Card Ladder. What's up, Josh? What's wrong, buddy? I, I did the copy paste. It didn't even matter. It, the, it was two people had first before I even got my finger on the comment box. Yep. <clears throat> Gotta be quicker, bud. Maybe it's like an iPhone thing where, like, iPhones get them 10 seconds earlier. <laughs> the iPhone conspiracy? I think that could be a factor here. Yeah. Took a nice walk on the Katy Trail today. Oh, nice. Nice. Where, how far? Where'd you guys go? Well, Christina's still under the weather. So it's just a solo stroll. And I usually make it to about to that ice house. Yes. That's a good spot. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. Just this, just hidden in the woods. When you do a solo stroll on a trail and you're in your middle ages, you have to put your hands behind your back when you do it. You do this. I do it now. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's like the wise, it's like the person that's, you know, getting older and becoming more wise. They put their hands behind their back and they're like, yeah, they're really <laughs> thinking. You know? Yep. Uh, it's especially potent when I just sort of pace back and forth. Yeah. So. And people are like, that guy must be just thinking up the craziest stuff in his head right now. He's probably, <laughs> he's probably a titan of industry over there. Look at him. With that, sweat, <laughs> with that sweatshirt and the flip flops. Look at him. <clears throat> yeah. Yep, it, it works. It worked. Okay, so uh, today is Friday, June 2nd. Welcome to the crossover. And we start with mail days. You have a, you, you have some, you have a few mail days, yeah. I'm not very good at it, holding off until crossover, let alone <laughs> like five minutes after I get them. Uh, so everyone already has seen these, but do it just in case crossover fans haven't seen them. This is 2007 exquisite noble nameplates LeBron. Mm. And his autograph is backwards because of the camera, but you get the idea. BGS 9, 10 auto. Nice. Game used. 2006 limited logos with a pretty nasty patch. Yeah. Very and then nice. the grand. Daddy is the 2007 with the most insane patch I've ever seen on this card. Just, just incredible. So happy about this. All three game used. Maybe I'm a game used simp now, Chris. Yeah, probably. Can you can you talk about all three just coming in a flurry like this? How does that happen? Well, I have a fourth. It just is in the vault, and so it's going to be here in a couple of years. Uh, <laughs> so that'll be exciting. The other ones. Uh, it's it's a flurry. You know, that's how I, I feel like you do it the same. You just, like, you get excited about something, and then you buy one, and then someone else has one. They see you're buying it. It's just sort of that way. Right, yeah. No, no, I know. It's just, it is funny how it works that way, you know? Like, uh, people die in threes, right? Celebrities die in threes, and exquisite grails come in fours. And I've been saying this for a few months uh, on this show. I think that the hobby... And people are like, when's the bottom and when's it going to turn around? It's when people are confident to buy cards instead of the money, mm -hmm. right? They'd rather have the cards at these prices and they'd rather own them than they would the money. And we're hitting some of those early thresholds for me. And you can, you can just see that by the fact that I'm buying. Like, I'm, you know, I think you said it to me earlier this week, like, watch what people do, not what they're saying. Right. Yes. Um, you know what I'm watching people do? I'm waiting for this. I'm waiting for this to turn into uh, ships. <laughs> so that's like, they said five days. You should be good. <laughs> I mean, I guess yeah. Five days is because uh, I won this Sunday night. So I guess five days is we got Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday. So Monday. This one I think I paid on a Sunday and it was shipped for you. A week, week from today. Oh my god! So it was. That's not five. Like, yeah, no. Well, this is before that post. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, well, congrats. On you got anything? The flurry. I do. I, 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 well, I have one awaiting fulfillment, so uh, see that in a few years, <clears throat> a few decades. And then uh, I've also got, I had this come in today. Oh yes, excellent. Yeah. So that is sick. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Is this the newest year? This is 2020. What year? 2023. Uh, what year is this technically? 2022. So is this his first Niners jersey photo? Yeah, for optic, yes. For optic, nice. it is. So. This is sweet because I love the optic gold vinyls. I love the prison black one of one. And I've got both now for CMAC. For every, every year. I mean, you know what? I think you don't know how the centering works on these, buddy. That's what I Do you like the design from this year? Do I like the what? Sorry. The design of optic for that year, this year? Uh, that's it's probably going to have to grow on. Okay, I like it. It looks like a, it kind of reminds me of like a magazine or something. Yeah. I think it's cool. Is the centering, I saw the centering on the, what did I see? Oh, the Bancaro, where it was pretty bad. Yeah, it's just hard to know what centered is supposed to look like, right? Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> if you kind of like refer to the, the, the top, the left and the right at the top. I it's centered. Know, I guess. Quick, is this, is this centered? I never understood how. It's like, um, sure, nine five. Like, like what? What prevented them from giving this a ten centering? Which part of it? There's like no. <laughs> I don't know. It's not a symmetrical. Problem. I don't understand. <laughs> that's, that's good. That's a... These are the things that keep us up at night. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Christina, do we have announcements to make? Card ladder related? No? Nothing this week? Nothing this week. Okay. I'm just going to keep it moving here. Uh, all right. Let's go to some questions. Lots of engagement questions this week in a completely different manner than last week. Last week was very industry focused, mm -hmm. and now this week is very market focused and also collector focused so why do you think it's market focused uh how could it not be <laughs> i think it i think when we have cards uh taking an absolute beating people are concerned <laughs> and i think they should be so it's that kind of is there questions of like, like optimism potentially i thought that's what you meant there are yep there are that's that's just what I think. That's that's just why I think people are sending in. Did you see the uh, questions? Well, I asked, asked because did you see the stock market today? No, I did not. It absolutely ripped. It's probably the biggest stock market day, at least that I can remember. Yeah, that's and P is up one and a half percent. Just like the overall market, like all bunch of stuff, all the tech, big tech companies went way up today. Yeah, well, there was earnings recently, oh. so. Oh yeah. Some boring PowerPoint meeting. I get it. <laughs> Maybe that's part of the question asking too. Market is on the mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. But let's start off with this from Brax Ball Cards. He usually has the last question. Today he's, he gets to go first because uh, it's not really. It's just a statement. He says it's the summer of crossover, baby. All right. Looking forward to. JCKN it's with y'all tonight. Looking forward to jacking it with y'all tonight? I don't know what that means. Josh, Chris, Christina, Nick. There we go. JCKN. Okay, I thought it I thought it was something else, but looking forward to Josh, Chris, Christina, and Nick it with y'all tonight. Thank you, Brax. All right. Uh, Publius 13. Gets, gets an early uh, bump as well here. <laughs> he says, uh, Jokic winning a chip. Did that happen? Did, or is there still a full series to go? 
It's over, baby. It is not over. Uh, Josh buying LeBron autos. We saw a few of those. Several consecutive weeks of the crossover on Friday. Are these, <laughs> <laughs> are these reasons to be optimistic, he asks. Uh, uh, <laughs> they already won the championship. Wow. Well, that's like the that's a Skip Bayless move right there where he just like anoints you as the winner so that if you lose, he can just shred you to pieces. And if you win, he's like, I told you. I, I told you. That's what I picked. Yeah. It's a win-win. That's the uh, – that's, that's bait meme, you know? That's that's bait. And I'm not taking it, Publius. Uh, it's over, though. Sweep. Sweep coming. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, reason for optimism? It's more like that the universe is balanced still. Because I don't – we're back. The show is back. That's the only thing I can see. I feel like I've always been buying LeBron autos, and Jokic has always been winning. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know what, Publius? Maybe, but the, I have to give credit where credit is due. Um, I have to say that Rare Air it, uh, uh, wins. Rare Air wins. Auction recap. Crew has won the battle for the hearts and minds of the hobby. Our portfolios are cooked. And uh, I don't know, maybe that's the reason for optimism is that, uh, you know, things can't get any worse. That's, that's the, that's the, uh, that's the path to optimism, right? Well, it's like Stephen A. Smith giving, uh, you know, rankings of the top five players in the NBA when he didn't play ever himself. That's what that's like. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Dude, you got the, uh, the NBA commentator um, analogies tonight. Have you been watching some, like, NBA talk recently? I have. This week, I don't know why, but I just happened to throw on, like, First Take and First Things First and all those shows, and it's, <laughs> it's bad. It's really bad. Like, I just happen to be watching. I look up. It's, like, top five Supermax contract players or something, and it was, like, Curry – LeBron, who's like 50 million years old, and it was like Tatum, Luca, and I was like, I don't understand how Jokic. He's literally like about to win Finals MVP, and he's still not in your top five list. What is this garbage? <laughs> and then Mad Dog called, called him like Luca Chonchich, like he didn't even know how to say his name. And <laughs> JJ Redick was like, What did you just say? Like this is all live. This is happening on the TV. I mean, yeah, I just uh, you must hate yourself to subject yourself to that. We've all been there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I want to punish myself out. this week. If, if, we're, uh, if we're acknowledging greatness in uh, sports, take them. I'd like to give a big shout out to Nick Wright, who picked the Suns to beat the Nuggets, picked the Lakers to beat the Nuggets, has picked Miami to beat the Nuggets in six, no less, and said that Jokic will be the worst MVP when it's all said and done in the history of the NBA. So salute Nick Wright. Keep going, bud. Keep going. I love how you're going to shift from, well, first of all, he's like your only hater left, so I'm glad that you're <laughs> latching on to him. Yes. But this week he texted me that you're not going to root for Jokic anymore because everybody likes him. You know, Nick Wright keeps me in the game. <laughs> You need Nick. Nick Wright is your Skip Bayless to he his Shannon Sharp. He, he, the... he keeps me in the game. Uh, if he pivots, I I don't know if I can hold on anymore. I might I might have to have to look for uh, the next <laughs> the next most hated because I just yeah I just it is I a think little he... gross you know it is a little gross to see. I think he picked the map. Yeah, he picked whatever. the map to win the championship. Who, who picked the Mavs? Me? Right. At the beginning of the season. Yeah, of course. <laughs> that should have been your death sentence. That should, you guys should have known right there. I did. I, yeah, you know what? I should have known. We picked the wrong city. We, we <laughs> mushed. Maybe, maybe we picked the right city, though. Maybe us coming to Dallas would just mushed the Mavericks. It was literally a choice between Denver and Dallas. Right. Yeah. And we had a choice in four days, so. You guys chose breathing over. <laughs> yeah. Yep. We chose a little closer to sea level. But yeah. uh, let's 
go to the next question here. All right, so this is incisive <laughs> from Black Griffin Cards. How much longer are we going to talk about and refer to the boom and the crash in the market? Right? I, yeah, I, I read this as kind of like, why, you know, okay, we talked about the boom, we talked about the crash. Can we just move on? And mm -hmm. why do we have to talk about it so much? What do you think about this? Well, I mean, if you look at like 2014 or 2015 to 2020, it's pretty incredible. Like, you basically can just say there was never a boom and never a crash before that, relatively. Like, if you look at graphs, there's like these little tiny blips compared to what happened in that stretch. Uh, and then, of course, it's coming down from there. And we're not back to 2014 or 2015, so it's not quite like a complete reversal, but it's just been such a huge boom and bust that I, it's hard to ignore it. Yeah, you know, I was thinking all day about this question, like how do I give this question a good answer? Because I understand what he's saying. He's like, this, this is like, it's kind of gross talking about markets so much. It is, yeah. it's not really the heart of why we're here. He's right, but this might not be a satisfying answer, but I just, I have a strong instinct, a strong sense that it's actually really important to talk about this. Um, that it's important to, you know, it, it's important to have a balanced analysis. If we're going to, uh, not, not you and me, but as a collective, as a community, if we're going to, you know, acknowledge and discuss with happiness when our market increases and be critical of it too. You know, if it increases too fast, we're gonna be critical of it. Uh, if, if, it if we feel like there's a sense of validation by the market going up, we're gonna, you know, be happy to discuss it, then we have to balance that equation when things go south. And we have to be willing to discuss that as openly and try to identify its causes with as much vigor as we can muster. And, you know, if you want some reasons for that, like maybe, you know, one reason is that let's figure out why it happened on both sides, you know, and, and like as gross as it is to get into the money topics, which it is, but like, if we can learn things about how this market works and look for red flags and problems, maybe we can not get killed buying things at dumb times. What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I like your point. Um, I will say that I feel like one thing that we have tried to do on the show that's maybe a differentiator from other content is that we're trying to look at it from a, perspective of like explaining why the market's moving the way it is as opposed to coming at it from the angle of you know we're flipping this is like where the money is being made this is like you know the angle you can make to make money for yourself we're really just looking at it as like a market to analyze you know like if if we had no skin in the game we could we could be able to do it but because we're collectors in the game we're not really as, as concerned with how much money we are making and losing as individuals so therefore we're able to kind of look at it a little more with uh, less bias in terms of like just the pure numbers, the ups and downs and the graphs that we started making. And we sort of like organically found our way into card letter that way yeah. because we were just fascinated by the market. So we'll probably keep talking about it, um, especially now that we're getting a little bit more realistic about where prices are. Like we're kind of getting back to the levels of what I feel is realistic. And so it's going to become more interesting to see what people are willing to pay to actually own cards as opposed to just like pure mayhem. But yeah, I totally get the, uh, um, you know, the, the, tire, the tiredness of having to talk about the market over and over. Yeah, I get it too. That's a great point. Uh, maybe something that occurs to me is like, look, once, like, let's say you're, uh, Let's say you own a house and you bought it five years ago. You don't care about the ebbs and flows of the real estate market at that point. You're living in that house for probably the next 30 years. Great. 
But if you're looking to buy a house, uh, you're going to be very interested in the market and where it might be in a few years and where it was a few years ago and how healthy it is right now. And is it being uh, pillaged by investors and so on and so forth. So maybe that's a, a way to think about it, you know? So, all right. But, but I, I, I uh, respect the spirit of that question. All right. From Onketch, AA Collectibles 91. All in, do you prefer the 2019 sports card market or the current 2023 market? There are lots of qualitative and quantitative factors in play. And I know what Onketch's answer is as well, for sure. Uh, he probably knows what ours is too, right? Uh, I don't know. I feel, I don't know. I feel like this is an obvious one, but maybe – it's maybe it's more obvious to you and I'm picking the wrong thing, but isn't 20, isn't 2019 the same as today price wise? It's just, we don't have any influencers. We didn't have any influencers then. <laughs> yes. Okay. So that's good. Cause that's the factor that you're going with is like, the, <laughs> you can basically buy the same stuff for the same price in, in most instances, but you don't have to deal with all the other BS. <laughs> that, you don't have to deal with the garbage, the, the, uh, the baggage that we yeah. acquired over the Years. Maybe that's a selfish answer, but I got, it seems like you got something obvious, so pile on. I don't. No, no, but I will pile on anyway. I love to pile on. So uh, 2019, um, before our market had been, uh, you know, decimated by things that decimated it, uh, you felt like, like there was uh, you felt like there was a a positivity in the air that wasn't manufactured. Yeah, you felt like you were a part of something that had a little bit of genuine momentum and that was going in a good direction. You know, do you want to be the, it's like, <laughs> it's like there's like, uh, the Dallas Mavericks are basically the same team, right? But do you want to be the one that just flamed out of the playoffs or do you want to be the one that's like, you know, has the playoffs ahead of them still? Knowing that your outcome is going to be the same either way, I, I would rather be like still mm -hmm. have the hope. Give me, let me yeah. keep the hope. All right, Get, let me have a little bit of hope here. It's it's not it it's it's very like uh, uh, tra tranquilizing to be, be watching this market crumble before our eyes. It it gives me a sense of tranquility, but uh, and it and it gives a sense of opportunity. But it doesn't really compete, in my opinion, with the sense of stability and optimism that 2019 had. The chat is just like on fire while you're talking. <laughs> the chat is like really, something is going on. In, I'm, in, uh, I'm, energy. I'm, listening, I'm listening to what you're saying, but I'm very distracted. No, it's good. It's good. Okay. So I like your thought. You like the, the optimism. Because in 2019, it, it did kind of feel, at least maybe you and I didn't, like outright predict it but it did kind of feel like we were onto something right. with the hub and it, it was a, it was a nice feeling to kind of be on the ground floor of something knowing it was coming and not have to deal with people piling on after the fact saying i told you so uh that was a nice moment yes. that we'll never get back yep for sure uh i, I think that's two votes for 2019 oh so. so you officially voted that's your vote yeah oh yeah dang i wanted to zag that uh, well, I don't. I can make the case for 2023. Like, I I like uh, personally. I like collecting more in 2023. I've got more players. Mm. I know more things. Right. I think he says like I, I was trying to remove the factor of like my own life and just pointing out the the market. Yeah, I'm going the other way though. I think to answer this question, I have to really like dig in on a personal level and say it's it's just better collecting today i know like the the, the amount that i know and have experienced is just so much more mm. yeah and then you know something just kind of like that comes to mind is like there's four years worth of max manufacturing capacity production that's taken taking place between now and 2019. 
how many flawless logo mans have been made between 2019 and now it's thousands and thousands <laughs> so many like i don't know if that's right but it's a lot okay there's so many cards have been made that i like i, I don't know if we really grasp that in the scheme of this all as well as like dude there's probably three times as many luca cards today as there were in 2019 right and some really good ones too you know so all right dude i think uh lamine needs to hook you up with a video edit of what he sent me which is but replace with uh you know fighting the urge to repost my prison black 101 with the superman you know the one i posted today you need that for, i need that for you no no, 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 thanks. Uh, <laughs> I like yours. That's good. I don't, ha I, I don't have any sale to uh, JCKN2. Well, your, uh, yours is the same as, because he started that with Old Price and the Mahomes Black, so yours is like the more, yeah, yours is actually the more uh, parallel to it. Well, yeah, but, I, you know, that's the Shaq PMG Green PSA4, right? That just sold for 175000 <laughs> Okay. I didn't even know it was a four until like, like I saw the sale. I never really checked the grade, and then I saw it a four. I was like, "Oh shoot, mine's a four. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to somebody on Clubhouse about this sale, and like, I just said, "Yeah, you know, in PSA four, that's that's like kind of the grade you want for that card." And then I just had a an out of body moment where I was like, "Wow, that's one of the, the stupidest sounding things." <laughs> Like, if you didn't know the context of what that means, and somebody says, yeah, PSA 4, that's what you're looking for. Like, what are you talking about? That's, yeah. <laughs> come on, man. Why do we have to do this tonight? Why do we, Dude, we to do PSA 4. When I got that 4 email, <sighs> pure elation. Just absolute <laughs> out-of-body experience, like you said. Just absolute joy. I was like, you know what? I thought it was a 5. Clearly, it's better. It's a 4. Right. What what was your mindset in 2019? If you can if you can rewind and just like really try to forget everything that's happened over the last four years, what was your mindset like? I feel like I've squeezed all the juice out of this question, but I'm I'm trying I'm trying because you're you're posing a nice little yeah. anecdote to this. Like look like listen, you just recorded episode 47 of Cardboard Chronicles. <laughs> all right. I think it's what you said earlier i just like i had this sort of uh optimism about us being sort of at this in this thing that other people didn't really know or care about and i i prefer that feeling to you know the post leaving joining and leaving of all these goobs i don't know it's <laughs> good. it feels like it's been a little bit tainted knowing that gary v has sent us through the uh, strainer for the last three years and now we're post that it doesn't feel as nice right yep Fair. Okay. There's, uh, there's duct tape all over my butt cheeks. <laughs> okay. Well, there's a, there is a episode title possibility here. Okay. Um, I just, I'm so fascinated by this, like, <laughs> this paradigm of thoughts pre versus post COVID. It's not just cards that we talk like this. It's like every market has. Mm -hmm. Before pandemic, after pandemic, and we, we've done it too. And I don't even know if like I, I'm starting to get sick of that divide, even though I understand why we make it. Uh, okay, hot, but Hasso Sports Cars is another question like that. I don't, maybe you know what he's getting at here better than me. He says, "Where does the overall integrity of the hobby stand today compared to pre-COVID times?" Hmm. Integrity. There is none. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I feel like he's getting at something that I'm not sure either. But it, it seems like, like I just, it's kind of like what I just said, where I can't un unsee the four years of like iffy behavior in order to pump the market and then pretend like it's not going down and just pretend we're all collectors again. I, that's the part where I'm like, I can't unsee. I can't unsee all that work. Mm -hmm. That's the part I, I feel gross about. Yeah, right, exactly. And the complete and utter lack of accountability on telling people to buy something and then 
like let's use Marvel for example. Going out and just telling everybody Marvel's the next thing, go buy Marvel, put all your money in Marvel, and then when it tanks because you actually never cared about it, they just leave it on the floor and move on to ticket stubs or whatever and type one photos. Like that part I can't unsee all of the content creation I saw around that. Because I we could if we ever did something like that it's like you got to revisit it you got to be like here's what we called here's what we talked about two years ago in crossover here's the graphs we were looking at and here's where it is today it's not even that hard you just you know you 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 made a wrong bet but if you're just going to move on that's where i lose all uh credibility your integrity goes out the window because now you're just going to tell me about the next thing it's like but you never even had any accountability for the last thing so why should i believe you this time exactly yeah, I would say we probably are at a lower integrity point. If you took if you if you took the average integrity level of every person in the hobby and summed it and compared it to the average integrity level of everybody in 2019, I think we're lower today. All right, I think that's partially a byproduct of who is in right now, the new people who've come in, and sort of what their aims are. But I also think that even though the hobby and a talking point about the hobby is that it's been around for a very long time, decades and decades and decades. The reality is for most of us and for the market as a whole, it's actually very, very immature. And we are at, we are learning things for the very, very first time. We're in the second inning. <laughs> That's all we I heard. I just, you're, you're just, your lips are moving, but I heard second inning <laughs> over and over and over. I have a question. Yeah. I have a very specific question, and only you can answer this, yep. Mr. Uh, hands Behind His Back Walker. You're the, you're the guy for this. Because yeah. this is on your brain already. I know you've been noodling on it. You've been noodling on, you know, where would we be if we hadn't had this pandemic boom and bust? Would, right. would we have had this nice slow up? My question is, and you said it earlier, sort of, that sort of every market has gone through this similar pre-COVID, post-COVID, up and down, stocks, crypto, everything. Were we going to have that boom and bust in cards regardless of, you know, like the, the, the sort of like pandemic stuck at home, everyone's buying cards thing? It just, it kind of feels like a little bit like we're just following every other market anyways. Or do you think we're completely separate and we have the same, these coincidences? No, no, I think that's, that's right. Um, there were, there was influencer attention coming into cards in 2019 and just to get our timelines, right. Uh, the stay at home orders didn't happen until March of 2020 when Rudy Gobert <laughs> touched microphones. So, yeah, I think that um, there already was an influencer onslaught happening, but the uh, accelerant in the form of everybody stuck at home looking up their cards was huge. And like one of the th- things that I really worry about is did we, we totally burn up like the next 10 years worth of organic hobby Mm. returning people who like maybe would have come back in 2026 but like because of the last dance and the stay-at-home orders and the influencer culture because of one of those things they they jumped in ahead of schedule and then here we are a few years later they had a really uh not so good time and did we basically borrow against and burn our future growth opportunity as an industry, as a community? Did we borrow against it and burn it so that we could have that little tidal wave of, of, uh, of a bubble in, in 2021 and 2022? That's what yeah. I, I worry about that. Let me ask it a different way then. Uh, is the, is the, like we have these reasons like influencers and flip and grind communities coming in and sort of like that's sort of what we're hinting at. But what I'm saying is, is the reason the card market went up really fast and then down really fast because the stock market and crypto went up and people had a bunch of extra money and they were looking for ways to grind and jump into something and they did <laughs> cards yeah. and then crypto and stocks went down. So they left. 
Yeah, could be. Definitely could be. I'm not saying that's true. It just because I just keep we keep seeing this sort of like discussion happening in other industries too, and it's like maybe maybe we're just part of that. Yeah, uh, I think I would separate those two groups. I think that people who make fortunes on crypto are one category of people, and then I think people who you know make their seven percent a year on stocks is a is a totally different one. I I do think that there was a <laughs> there was a, a a portion of the rise and grind community who came in and had their fun and then left. Uh, maybe yeah. they left, maybe they went to NFTs, maybe they went to memorabilia, maybe they went to ticket stubs, maybe they just went back to crypto, maybe they just stopped. But yeah, there's like, here's an exercise that I did the other day. I went to the list of people that I follow on Instagram, which like, I don't curate that very carefully. You know? <laughs> I love it. I'm not great at like <laughs> following back either, which is my bad. But like I was, okay, so I was looking at people who I follow and I was trying to figure out roughly what percentage of them are still active <laughs> on Instagram. and. To me, I would say somewhere between one out of five to two out of five, like every five that I would scroll through, one to two of them have gone dark for a year, for like a yeah. year or two. A lot of accounts started going quiet either in the spring of 2021 was their last post or the spring of 2022 was their last post. And you're not just saying, and, and you're, the point you made where you're, you're curating is that you're not just following anybody. Like you're actually following people who you felt were worthy of a follow. Therefore, we're like in the hobby for real at a certain point. Somewhat. Yeah. I mean, I, I could have curated my follows better. But yes, it's not just like I just follow every single account that put hashtag the hobby on a post. Like, sure. Yes, it's people that I recognize on some level. Sure. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So... <laughs> That's what I said. Well, I think we, I know I sent you that graph and text, the, what's it called? Or I put it on my story too. The, uh, I don't even know what that thing's called. The hype and the hype graph, whatever that yes. is. Yeah. I do feel like we hit the point where we started getting absolute mania from people that are like, people have never, never heard of the hobby in their lives are jumping in and they're just like buying for the sake of buying. Cause they heard you can make money. I feel like that definitely happened. People that I know, they're like, Oh, should I be buying? I heard. I feel like we hit that, that point, whatever that top is. What's the top? It's the new paradigm, halfway in between delusion and denial. Because the new paradigm to me is like, dude, everyone in their, everyone in their like, mailmen are going to start buying cards instead of 401ks. And like, <laughs> we hit that. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. No, I never really saw the, like, I remember when <laughs> there's, the chat is just, Hatching memes left and right tonight. Okay, I never really saw um, cards get anywhere close to the Bitcoin mania, where I'd be on my Facebook feed of people, you know, that I've accumulated over the last twenty years, and maybe somebody I haven't talked to in ten years, mm -hmm. posting a picture of their Coinbase graph. Uh, I, we never got close to that with cards. But we not, did not, not at the volume. Sure. Yeah, not at not the volume, but at like the per per individual that's involved was feeling that sort of mania. <laughs> All right, hey, where on this graph would you put um, enters auction recap cabal? Maybe <laughs> maybe they happened right around here. Yeah, maybe. of course here. Yeah. Okay. I like that. It's like, uh -oh. and the, the recap is always the same. It's like, uh, man, same copy three months ago. Someone's fucking getting margin called. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like card, Giannis Prison Gold down four hundred thousand. Still feels high. Still <laughs> yeah. To go. Okay, yeah. Well, all right. Uh, okay. Well, I remember you and I were posting, wow, this card went from 28 grand to 450. This seems a little crazy. I don't know if we should. Uh... <laughs> One of the uh, weirdest days in the hobby was that 
MJ Fleer PSA 10 750K, the show <laughs> we did immediately after that auction. Yep. That was I would I would love to go back and rewatch that sometime if I didn't hate watching myself. I would love to go back and just see that because I remember we people were like you know we were supposed to come on and pop champagne or something, mm. and instead we were uh, just not very happy about it. And also because like we're kind of like not not enjoying everybody just patting themselves on the back constantly on social media, which was happening a lot, but also just because it felt off you know it felt felt off it felt it added a burden onto the collector who just wants to collect their cards and not have to try and play a market can i can i call the top i have the moment you're gonna laugh so hard i have the moment the top was in let's go it was the moment that gary v said i have hundreds of friends that would buy that card for a million dollars right i oh yeah great quote that's like that's just pure pure delusion and that's just uh, that's just insane you have friends that will pay 10 you have thousands of friends that would not pay a hundred thousand dollars a week earlier but now they'll pay a million right that's just pure insanity like makes no sense <laughs> or maybe the top was when uh very closely related to that time when timberland came on instagram live with his jordan <laughs> Fleer <laughs> with the sean watson <laughs> yeah Maybe that was around the time. I don't know. It's like, uh, like, well, we're screwed, guys. Someone that that loves next to nothing. He bought like the rock card for like a million dollars with the Sean Watson too. Remember that? They're like having this fancy dinner. Look at us and our top two hundred rock card. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it was only we were mad because it was like the pop is three hundred, guys. This is never gonna last. Like two hundred people are gonna sell this tomorrow if this is the new price. It's gonna crash it. This is like simple economics, simple math. Yeah, let me see if I can find like one of those pictures. <laughs> and then you, you got you got smart card people buying it at 500k anyways, so maybe maybe I'm wrong. Right. Yeah, exactly. Do you remember the, we, you and I did a crossover maybe like a month before that, and everyone in the chat was getting real excited about predicting where the Jordan Fleer could go in 10 years or something. I think was the topic. Right. It was like I thought that card could. Be be 250k in 10 years it's like i think it's going to be 750 in a week so hold my beer right right exactly oh no did timbaland remove it uh, yeah so i found a post by uprocks called uh, uh deshaun watson shows off his 45k the rock Miami rookie card. <laughs> yeah, that one. That one was funny. Oh, it's gone. It got I wonder deleted. why. And then I guess The Rock tweeted about <laughs> it. Future, <laughs> Smart business. <laughs> future Ooh, yeah. president. Oh. Future president of the United States, Dwayne Johnson. Oh. And uh, that, that that got deleted as well. Uh, uh, somehow, though, Sean Watson got in trouble for. You know all kinds of stuff, and he ended up making more money after it. So maybe he's a smart businessman, and we're all the we're the idiots, you know. Yeah, I think uh, here we go. Here we go. Thank you, South. All right, here we go. There. This is iconic. It is. That's the one I was thinking. That's exactly the one I was thinking of. Look at these guys. Look at those gold forks. I mean, this this is iconic. It's funny now that those gold forks are worth more than that rock card. <laughs> the card just chilling on. How do you think this photo was staged? It probably took two hours to stage that photo. <laughs> like, whose idea was it? Oh, so that, that, those were in the same week, I think, right? Yeah, th this was all in the same time span for sure. Do you remember when that Pokemon stuff was going down and that guy was like, Swindling people out of a million dollars for open boxes, and then he brought, he like brought it over to them in a bag, and they, those people are like, "This is our firm that we've made, and we're gonna open this box live, and we're gonna get all these, you know, we're gonna sell the packs." And then they were all fake. That was like another moment too, where it's like, <laughs> yeah, yep, yep, not a good look. And, and people were calling themselves 
guru and stuff, card guru. They've been in the in the game for a week. Card co- yeah. Kahuna. <laughs> Jeez. Or maybe when uh, when the BBC E fellow said uh, we all got duped, agreed. Yeah. Maybe that was a moment. Do you remember all the uh, videos that came out on YouTube at Dallas Card Show, and people were just moving cards at 10x inflated value, trade value back and forth, just boom, boom, boom. Oh, yours is worth 80 grand. Mine's Kevin, my Kevin Durant Chrome refractors worth 100 grand. Yours, like, we got a good trade going here. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> okay. Look, there's there's more questions that like relate to this topic. So I'll keep pressing on here. Um, You're so strong. Thank you. thank you. Okay, Goats and Grails says, why are card prices down over the last two to three years, but attendance at card shows is way up? All right. So that, that's, I thought of this question as you were kind of talking about the card show content. And like, well, one reason not to be flippant is because uh, the pandemic has largely subsided. So that's a factor. Uh, but the other is that um, I think if there's one thing I've learned for sure over the, uh, over the last however long, it's, it's, it's that um, prices going down have not happened in the same proportion as total sales volume going down. So mm. Like I was looking, like comparing the secondary market sales volume of uh, May of this year to May of last. Well, actually, that that there was a huge drop off there. Um, I guess the point that I want to. The point that I'm trying to get at here that I don't have a clean data point to illustrate right now is that there's still about on an annual basis, there's still about two to $2.5 million being spent on the secondary market for sports cards, but we've seen prices absolutely collapse, um, at both on an average basis and, but especially the most visible place that's happening is the high end. So, you know, a Giannis Prism Gold having two sales at over half a million dollars and now selling for a hundred thousand dollars. You know, that's what, what is that? An 80% drop in value. Secondary trading volume has not dropped 80%. It's, it's come down 20, 25%. Like volume is down, but not nearly to the same extent. The prices are down. So it, it's certainly possible that there are more people at shows. There might even be more people participating in the hobby, but psychologically, they're not prepared to spend even 30% of what was being spent a few years ago. What do you think about that? I think you're right. I'd also point out that like mathematically, I don't, don't think the number of participants at a show necessarily correlates with the overall price. Cause I, didn't we say that like the biggest card show at national was like in the eighties when the card prices were much lower than they are today. Sure. I think a part of that, that is like a lot of the activity that goes on at shows lives within the margins of the deal making and the back and forth. And it doesn't really matter what the prices are at that time. And I think the, but the heart of the question is like, you know, it seems like there's a bit of a uneasy feeling about the direction of the market going down so fast. And wouldn't people be, therefore like depressed and not want to go to the shows anymore maybe but i think that's offset by you know the covid restrictions being lifted and people that are in the hobby are just like this is this is it like we're all going to go to these shows this is... and there's also a factor of like the social aspect of the show is separated from necessarily like buying and selling like you and i go to these shows just for the the community aspect and less on the uh, buying and selling. So there's lots of reasons, but I think what you, you hit on in the fact that these shows can happen no matter where the market's at, I think are the two. Yeah. Right. And like the, that, that's just the, the, the thing that I keep coming back to here is that 
price the price of items doesn't need to reflect the level of participation in the hobby those two things can be going in different directions and it, you know it the so like i just did a quick calculation your sales volume from may of 2022 to may of 2023 is down 30 percent which is a ton <laughs> okay that's a ton it's definitely down but the price of that Jan's Prism Gold from May of 2022 to today is down 80%. So <laughs> there's a huge difference there. And actually, you can probably, if you really wanted to work through the numbers of it, um, for total sales volume to be down 30%, but the value, of, let's just say the value of many items is down 80%, which it's not. Let's just say it was. If that was the case, you would have a clear statistical argument for an increase in the number of people in the hobby buying more things at lower prices right but not everything is down 80 percent. plenty of things are flat most things are down a few things are up it's it just depends on what you're looking at but uh, can't, the, can't the volume stay flat but overall prices go down because of the increased supply of more cards being released too absolutely yep it sure can definitely can. but but from one year you know the the number of cards being produced isn't, you know, 40% or whatever the, the offset of that Giannis and stuff. I think the point you're illustrating is that right now we, we are so hyper-focused on the high end being crushed and that's sort of like the attention grabbing, auction recapping, doomsday feeling we're getting. Uh, but I mean, you're, you're seeing less of a downward spiral in the mid-range, right? Like you posted the optic orange, you, you had some sort of thought about that. Is that like a common thing? Yeah, yeah, the mid-range certainly feels like it's stabilized much better and that now we're seeing the high end plummet in, in, a, in a spectacular fashion. And I think that, uh, so like the question I posed was, uh, last night I, I had a sale come through to Card Ladder of a Mahomes 2017 Optic Orange number to 199. All right, kind of like a random card, a, a nice card, which is kind of random, okay? And it sold in a BGS 9.5 for f about four grand, okay? Uh, and it checks out. Good sale. Then uh, we have the day before a Mahomes Prism Gold out of 10 BGS 9.5 which like arguably is one of his very best cards. We have that sell for a hundred grand. And I look at it and I say, what would I rather have if I had a hundred grand? Would I rather have 25 of these Mahomes Optic Oranges out of 199? Or would I rather have the one Prism Gold out of 10? Yeah. And it's, to me, it's not even close. It's not even, even close. I, much, much rather have the grail, the, the prism gold. Uh, it's, it's such a, an impressive card to be able to have in your collection. Yeah. And, I, and that's dawn, that made me start thinking in combination with some work that M&T Trading has been posting, showing that the number of six-figure cards that have sold um, this year compared to last year has just fallen off a cliff. It just made me quickly come to terms with the fact that like the most scared buyers in our market by a long shot right now. The high end. The high end. Can I give you a theory? I'm just, I've been workshopping this for the last 45 seconds. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> I got a Christina laugh. Let's go. <laughs> uh, I already forgot it. No, I'm just kidding. What if I'm thinking about this 2019, 2023 connection. I like where this is going. What if we have like way more people in the hobby today than we did in 2019, even after they've all left after the crash, even that's what we've been saying, right? People have been leaving. What if we just like added a bunch of people and this feeling that we're getting crushed is just coming from these select few super high end guys who came in and inflated it, started taking out loans. We heard about that. We had issues with these loan programs, these massive dollars being spent by, let's say, a group of 20 people. And those 20 people left. And then you and I, and I both, 
both know that in cards, if 20 people leave high-end, auctions are can go way down. You know, it takes two people to make an auction. What if you lose 20 high-end bidders? That can make a huge effect that makes it feel like the market lost 100,000, 40% of its people. But we've seen anecdotally that at these card shows, there's still a lot of like volume of people and we're seeing some stabilization in the mid end and low end. So what if my, my working theory is like, what if we just lost 20 people that got margin called and we'll just wipe those out. We'll see some of these prices keep dipping on the high end and we sort of stabilize after and nationals rip, rip roar and exciting fun and everyone's having a blast. And we pulled the op This is the optimistic take, by the way, this might not be true. This is my optimistic hat on. We've added people over the last four years. A bunch of them stuck around. They've went. They've gone through the the destruction, and they've they've enjoyed it, and they're gonna keep going. And now we're back to like realistic prices across the board. And yeah, I love that take, man. And I, I would uh, I would even maybe massage it this way. You don't even need those twenty people to leave. You just need them to not feel as confident yeah. about bidding really high prices. You just need them to scale back their optimism a bit. And that, that'll that do it. <laughs> that That's more than enough. And uh, Ankesh points out that year to date, using uh, the, the card ladder, low, mid, and high end indexes. Oh, good. The low end is down 12% year to date. The mid range is down 8% year to date, and the high end is down 20%. Year -to -date. Yeah. And you and I both know that 20% for the high end, given the rarity of some of those cards in that high end, is a big number. Yes, that's a, that's a very big number, and it lags because there's probably other high end cards that are down that just haven't logged the new data point yet for the index yes, exactly. to capture it. If all and then, of those cards in the high end had sold, I feel like, you know, it would be like a minus 40 or 50. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, the other thing that sort of props up the high end is that uh, vintage high end has been mm. a lot more stable, a lot more stable. So that kind of, you know, high end doesn't discern between vintage, pre-war, modern, ultra modern. It doesn't, it just, they're all together. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, all right, let's go to um, this. Ryan Bitter had a, had something on this topic. He said, after the influx and the exits of people during the pandemic. Now, see? Ones that That's like the assumption we make. That's, that was the point I'm trying to like maybe poke at, but go ahead. Yeah, no, I know. I know. I know. He says, are those who are there today, are they, are they here to stay? Mm. Well, my argument to that is like, if you can make it through the last year, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, bud. You're stuck with us. <laughs> Dude, I'll be honest with you, man. When I'm looking at sales and I see like, like last night, like seven people buy a copy of the 97, 98 Mental Universe base PSA 8 Michael Jordan for a hundred bucks a piece. I think that's about what it was signed for. I'm like, who the hell are you people? <laughs> buying this PSA 8 winning this auction like who are you like I really something so annoying about me is like when me and Christina are driving to a new through like a town or something I, I'll just wonder out loud like, who lives in this house what yeah, do do? yeah. I do that yeah, yeah. I do. it's very annoying and I just I'm thinking as these auctions end and I look at the feedback scores and they're all different winners I'm just like who are you guys what are you doing with this car, yeah. what are you doing? What are you guys doing? How many of you are dealers just buying it to put in your display case? How many of you are like brand new collectors, like getting your footing, starting with a card like this? How many of you are like long time collectors, just maybe adding another one to the pile? Who are you? Can I, can I try to help illustrate this with some numbers? Sure. If you were to put a percentage on how many people in our market could afford a million dollar card? What percentage would you put on that? How many, what percentage of the people in the card market could afford a million dollar card? <sighs> a tenth of a percent? Yep. I don't know. And we're, yeah, and like we're all freaking out about cards not selling for a million. Okay, so that affects none of us. Great. 
-hmm. Okay. What about the percentage of people that would be willing to create tons of content about, you know, being an influencer, making all these videos at these card shows, doing what you and I do, posting stuff every day, every week. What percentage of the people in the market do you think participate at that level? Very few. Yeah. Very few. Right. We, we feel this pain at those two levels. We feel the pain of influencers telling us everything's down, everything's bad. We feel the pain of 10 people that can afford these million dollar cards, not buying them at a million dollars anymore. But the reality is there's like 99% of people are the people living in these homes, the people buying these hundred dollar cards, the people going to these shows, going through dollar bin cards. Like, you know what I mean? Yep. Like that's the actual sort of way mass volume that none of us can really actually see. Cause we're not, that's not what, you know, is uh, visible through the YouTube or the Instagram or, you know, the big money. Yeah. Oh, that's super well said. I have a lot of admiration for a collector who joined in 2021 or 2022 and maybe got involved with a player like Luca, Mahomes, Giannis, Kobe, anybody really. There's very few exceptions to this and saw the value of all the cards that they bought maybe de decline by 30 50 percent or something like that and they're still here and they're still pushing and they're learning and they're growing and they're optimistic like that person deserves a little more commendation than somebody like myself who you know mm. I've, I've had the luxury of being able to buy and accumulate cards and build a collection since 2016. Yeah. so it's not nearly as painful even though I've taken some fat L's, it's not nearly as painful for me because I have, I have this much longer horizon to balance it all out. Yeah. <laughs> You've made this point specifically about Mahomes collectors that, I mean, let's be honest, you as a sports fan, when would you start to peak as like having the most confidence in Mahomes as a fan of his 2020, 2021? Like, so if you actually, were a huge sports fan of Mahomes outside of cards, and you thought, man, it would be so great if I could connect to Mahomes on a deeper level. If there was some other way I could connect, oh, cards would be awesome. What if I could just go in for fun, buy a couple of his $1,000 cards, rookie card, silver, prism, whatever, and just have some fun with it, and you just get absolutely clobbered. And you're like, the guy was won two Super Bowls. He won an MVP. What am I doing wrong? I don't even understand... Like, I thought I nailed this. I hit the freaking jackpot. I, I rooted for my favorite player who turned out to be the next Tom freaking Brady, and I've lost half my money? This doesn't make any sense. So it's like, what do we do to sort of soften the blow for that person and keep it enjoyable? And I think the answer is <coughs> pointing out just, like, the fun of cards, like, all the things that, that make it fun. Like, why did what brought you in and sort of what what – we need to dice. We need to open up the brain of that person and be like, "Why are you still here? You have you've been beaten to shit, and you're still here. Why?" <laughs> that sort what do you of think they would people. say, like hypothetically, put yourself into their shoes. What would they say? I've talked to a couple of them, um, and I think a lot of it's like they had a similar story to you and I, where like they had they already had this sort of like nostalgia for cards coming in. And that's sort of like overpowering. And, and I think they knew they can, they can kind of like self admit that this is a unique situation, this little window, and this isn't going to be normal. And they can kind of keep going forward and not have to worry about this sort of insanity, you know, ever, maybe, maybe not ever happening again, but not happening again in the near future. And they can, they can assume some sort of stability going forward. And they just like the cards. They, you know, the, the fun of it and the enjoyment they get out of, curating their collection as a way to end i think a, a really good is thing is that i would think that person spent money on cards that was a you know not their primary source of like savings and you know food budgeting and mortgage payment this was like how you and i started where it's like you know if i lose all this money that's okay i like the cards this is what i'm going to start doing and if you go into it with that thought you know you can kind of be shielded right Absolutely. Yep. I, all true points. And, uh, you know, I, I want to quote what Lameem said because I like it as a potential title. He said, <laughs> Dark, 
He said for my butt cheeks. <laughs> he said, uh, "Ain't no fun being down eighty percent." Which I, <sighs> well, I like that as a title. Possibly. Poke at some of those theories. Is, am I missing one, or is or are some of them overshooting, and people are just like, "Fuck you, I lost money, I'm out of here." No, you know that's the thing is that uh, if the card, if the hobby is working the way that I think it works, or the way that it works for me, even being down, <laughs> even being down eighty percent, you're still you've still got that sucks. All right, that is just getting your ass kicked. And I think a lot of us have a story like that. <laughs> even if we didn't, a lot of us have a story of buying a card that we're down 80% on. But even if we didn't, plenty of us have a story about a card that is now 80% less than it was at its peak, even if we paid less, way less for it at some other point. Almost sure. everybody has at least something in their collection that they, that they can relate to on that level. And yeah, it is, it is miserable. It's not fun. It's a very terrible feeling. But if the hobby is working the way I think it works, you, we keep coming back because it's it's a fun game to play. It's it's something that I still want to do. It's something that I feel like you know what like can, how much worse can it get? You know, I have to, at some point I have to look at it and say, you know, am I a quitter uh, because I got my ass kicked? You know, or or did I did I tank this season? And uh, you know, now I'm com- now I'm now I'm coming back stronger. I've learned a few things. I'm coming back stronger. How about that? Uh, I got another one. Another. Uh, you know, people keep coming back to Vegas. Keep getting your ass kicked. Lose all your money. That place is still humming along. People, people keep coming back to lose more. And that's like, that's like a freaking. You're gonna lose. That's a sure thing. At least with like cards and stocks and some of these other things. Like at least there's some chance of like, you know the steady up and right coming back whereas gambling is people gamble more than ever gambling is like that industry grows daily man that is like a booming industry all the time and it's a losing game so people like the punishment yeah yeah so the currency project points out i have a lot of hobbies i've got 100 percent on right yes like uh going to sporting events is just pure minus 100 (laughs) percent (laughs) <laughs> okay, especially especially if you uh, your team doesn't make the yes. playoffs that, then you're down 120 <laughs> percent <laughs> by the way you can't go down all right, anyway, all right. so uh he, he he goes not to make money uh assuming that's the overall mentality here it's a hobby and you should enjoy it right. <laughs> <laughs> okay so that's a good point um i just I hesitate to make that point because I don't want to send a signal that that the hobby is a consumer good, that collecting cards is a consumer good because uh, it's not. It's not. This this market is a collectibles market, right? Like we went over this last week a lot. I won't belabor the point. But I don't. There there is a reasonable expectation that when people are buying collectibles, that they're buying into a stable market that's gonna function in a, a pretty healthy manner. You know, that's, that's the one thing I'd say to that. But yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear from somebody, maybe a, a blog or a podcast, like on this topic of, you know, because I, I can speak to it. Like Christina and I, you know, bought a really nice Luca rookie at the peak about a year ago that we're probably down 50 to 60% on tens of thousands of dollars lost. Or I could go back to the Jordan. <laughs> the, the, show the fucking Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only one that you actually were like, I'm so fucking, like, you're actually mad about that. The other ones, you're not. That one, you yeah. are. Well, because the, the guy Yates of uh, that Beckett YouTube video from like 10 years ago when he has all those legacy sh- Okay, well, it's this guy who just flooded the market with these. And uh, how could I have known that he had a dozen waiting in the wings after I bought mine. They're not as rare as some of the other. Like the Luca, it's like, yeah, it's down, but like there's only 10 of them. You know, you don't feel as beat up when you see one every week. You don't see one every week. Yeah, dude, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But like that or the other, you know what? I do still keep coming back. And I do still like the, the, the totally rational way to look at it is to say, 
what's the card worth right now today? Not what did I sink into it? Uh, you know, if I could turn back the clock, but what is that card's actual market value today? That's it just, that's where I'm starting from. That's what I have. That's where I'm starting from, right? That's, that's the rational mindset that you try to put yourself in is that. I wanted to point out that we usually hover at least in the last, like with the market going down, this show has been hovering around about 50 to 60 people on the show. And we've been at 80 to 90 all night. Yeah. And I'm telling you, you can make fun of me if you want, Christina, you can too. The stock market going up today is like really ju juice some people's excitement. And that's why when you asked at the beginning, I thought like, at least I was, I came on the show and I'm like, dude, my stocks are up. Am I buying more cards today? Is cards back? Are we back? Like, is this, it? are we doing this? Is like, are we going up today? I feel like the market can turn that quick. Like I feel like, and it, especially with like national coming up, we're talking about 2019 vibes. It doesn't take much, dude. Like people can get excited about stuff again, quick on a dime. Absolutely. Yeah. And look, I mean, guys and girls who are buying stuff in the hobby, everybody wants to feel like there's, a, there's room for yes. growth on what they buy. Yes. Okay. And that's so important. I think that's such an important part of just the general mindset. Nobody wants to buy something, especially a collectible with a high level of confidence that if they just had waited a year, they could have gotten it for less. Something that can complicate that is like a card that comes out that like, you know, you can only get right now and you might have to overpay, but that's the premium you pay for the right to own it. There are some of those examples. For the most part, there has to be a belief that there's margin here, that there's room mm -hmm. for growth, that there's opportunity. There, there needs to be a level of belief in that. And so we sort of see, you can almost, it's, it, it's, a, it's a gross proxy for, a, for almost for like a person's level of luxury spending budget to see at what point they buy cards with the belief yeah. that there's room for growth. It's, you know, that's, you can almost do that. Well, why do you think there's 90 people tonight versus 60 last week? What's the difference? Uh, I, I think you've got a very good point. Um, why are people? Why is anybody watching the show on a Friday night after the pandemic? I I, ask, I question everybody of that. <laughs> why are we? Why are what? What lack of social lives do you and I have? To yeah, be why are we? Why are we doing this? On, I mean, this show made so much sense Friday nights during the pandemic. This was a social gathering, yeah. and, and now it's like, well, is this the right time? I mean, I'm sure there are better times to do it, but I also think that like. There were very good questions sent in, and mm. I think the market talk mm -hmm. is a talk that no, nobody is having right now because it's scary and it's painful and it's ugly, and we need to have it. And Do you think people like you think people like the market topic, and that's kind of that, that's kind of our sweet spot for engagement? <laughs> RJ Freed says he's in the bathroom right now. Uh, I think <laughs> I. I I don't, I, I think that there's a time and a place for it. I think sometimes, I think most times people tune in to maybe hear more collector focused talk, but sometimes, you know, when a mm. homeless person gold goes for a hundred grand and, you know, stuff is like, like people need to believe that they can go and have an honest conversation about really high profile stuff, taking a beating. I think that the market talk for me at least is, is more fun to talk about because it applies to everyone in the room. Whereas like my LeBron stuff, like you're not going to be interested in it. I'm not as interested in Rudy Gobert PCs. Like the PC stuff is just the collecting discussion is fun. It's good if you can talk about it at a higher level and you can abstract it out, but it's harder to connect with everybody at that level. Whereas the market is like, we can talk about lots of interesting things. And I don't know if that's good or bad, but, it's good to mix it up, obviously, too. Yeah, for sure. For sure, man. I agree. Okay. Here's a, here's a tough question from Ferris Jabbar. He says, how long should you hold on to a card that has taken a huge hit price-wise? Well, you should sell it to Drake at fair price today. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's a tough question, dude. It's tough because I get to say, from the question asker that they're frustrated and I 
they're not alone. Like, you, I mean, you said, it, you just said it like there's everyone is down 80% before they sell on a, on something like there's no one that's gotten through it with just doubling their money on vintage and jumping from the perfect thing to the next. So it's kind of happening to everybody. Um, but the, specifically the question I guess is like, I'm going to answer it with a, with a cheat and you and steal what you said earlier, which is like, don't think about what it was. Don't think about how much you're down. Just like think about it in terms of, is this, is this something I want today? And if you're only thinking about it strictly money wise, and you're not thinking about it as like a collection, because if it's a collection thing and you don't want it in your collection, you don't like the card, just, you know, easy answer, just sell it, buy something else that makes you happy. But if it's like a money thing, uh, you know, is there something that you think is better right now? Something that you feel more, if it's a prospect that you're worried about in the future and you'd rather put it in Mahomes and they both have this similar downward trajectory, but you feel like Mahomes is probably a bit safer than, you know, if I'm holding a Desmond Ritter card, uh, uh, then you should sell it and buy the other thing and not worry about how much you're losing. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I completely agree. That's the thing that's really tough is like it's uh, it's counterintuitive, but it's difficult and it's difficult to think this way, but uh, it's, a, it's a sunk cost. The, the money that's been lost in that card is gone and the most optimal way to act in a market is by having a sober recognition of just this is what this thing is worth at this point in time. That's it. Now, I know markets psychologically have a lot of this, you know, oh, I bought this stock at $100 a share and it's $50 now. I'm just going to wait till it gets back to 100 and I'm going to sell it and then I'm going to break even. Well, the problem is while you're sitting there waiting for it to break even, you could have sold it at 50 and deployed that money in other areas that made more sense. So in other words, when you're sitting with a stock that's worth $50, even though you're not, not buying it, you own it, you effectively are buying it at $50. Or if you're sitting here with a card that's gone down, whatever it's gone down, it's taken a huge hit, you're, you're still, you own this card and it's as if you had purchased it at that price because if you wanted to, you could get the cash out and spend it somewhere else. So it's, it's always, I think, wisest to just embrace where the card is today, not have the psychological anchor around our necks of, well, I paid this much, so I just have to wait for it to get back or something. That's just, that's, that's, not, that's not the reality of the situation. That, maybe that would make you feel psychologically better, but there, there's, uh, that's, that's not the wisest way to have funds spent. Yeah, 100% agree. Okay. Uh, all right, last question here that's sort of like in the vein of this market stuff. And I like this question. I saved it for last because we've been talking about maybe like the last five years, the last year, the last two years. This question <laughs> zooms out to like 50 years, all right? 50? So, oh, my God, I'm not no, that old. Not, yeah, okay, well, <laughs> AUS Auss collector says, is the hobby just fine? Is it going on the right trajectory? I was listening to a podcast and Dr. Beckett's friend Richard was talking about the 52 tops mantle. And in the mid 70s, according to Richard, it was a $500 card in good condition. By the mid 80s, it was a $3,000 card. Then it went back down to $500. And it got me thinking, is that really any different than what we're seeing now? What does anybody else think about this? And those are like decades, not because we're talking about like, oh my God, I 10 X my money in one year and I 10 percent of it back the next year. Like that question there is like the mantle is like decades. It's crazy. Yeah. There's no way anybody has patience like that anymore. Right. Right. Good. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, I don't know. I feel like the world reacts a lot quicker today than it did in those examples. Just, you know, you know, like technology and social media and the movement of communication is just so much quicker. I don't know that we'll see that type of thing play out ever again. But, um, you know, I, I, like I just said earlier, I, I think we're going to have these pivot points where people are just all of a sudden really excited about the hobby again. And everyone that was panicking was just, you know, get them out of here. We don't need them. We're back. 
you know, we don't need that. We don't need that negative talk anymore. We're back, baby. Like that's going to happen again. And it's just, we're just going to keep having these ups and downs and then we'll have another one where people are panicking again. I don't, I don't know. Just, uh, and you, you and I'll just be, keep, keep being here, given the opposite take of whatever the current sentiment is, I guess. Love it. Love it. All right. Uh, dude, I'm going to do this. Give me, give me 30 to 60 seconds. All right. I have to get this take off here and now. On this, on this, no, 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 this isn't that. This isn't that. This is, a, this is like something your eyes will roll back and you'll fall asleep. But let me just, I'm going to say. All right. For this one or? Uh, in philosophy, there's something called the Hegelian dialectic. All right. <laughs> okay. Just, let's just go with this. Just roll with this. All right. The Hegelian, Hegelian dialectic. What did you just the say? Hegelian dialectic. All right. Oh my God. What it's, nothing, doing? it's nothing crazy. It's just like. He made the observation that the way that thought develops in society is first you have a thesis, like a belief, right? And like, so in the hobby, we have a thesis of like, to the moon, we are in the second inning, things go up forever, 10,000 people want to buy a million dollar Jordan card. That's the thesis. <laughs> then, yeah. then you have, then, you, then he said, part two, you have the antithesis, the antithesis, which is a complete rejection of that. So we we have the antithesis in the hobby, which is like, this is terrible. Market is crashing. It's collapsing. They're just we got card, cardboard. It's trash. What do you got? It's not even an investment. Yeah. Yes, exactly. All that. And then the third and final phase is synthesis, which is the thesis and the antithesis merge together to get the the synthesis all right and the synthesis is those two views come together somehow one maybe carries over the other but like they merge together and then you start the cycle all over all right and then that becomes a thesis and it gets a reaction okay the reason why i'm bringing this up is that we need to allow ourselves to have the antithesis we need to have the antithesis. We had the thesis. We were all great about it. The way the human works, we're very reactionary. As, a, as thinkers, as he, when we hear things, we react to it. We want to disagree with it. We want to push back on it. We have to allow ourselves to really flesh out and have the antithesis so that we can react to that. You know, for every guy who saw like, wow, Jordan Fleer, 750K, this is dumb. We also need to have the guy who says, wait a minute, Chris is whining like a baby about the state of the market. Dude, you're, you're taking it too far. Let's, let's get back. Let's, let me react to that. Let's get back to the middle. Let's get a synthesis here. So I think that's like, we as a community, if we're going to keep putting one foot in front of the other, we have to have this moment too. We have to like acknowledge what's happening so that we can react to it as well. So we don't get just stuck in the thesis. We gotta take our medicine. Yes. It's like we gotta we gotta freaking you wanna get stronger, you gotta lift weights. You gotta do the crappy thing, you gotta get through the crappy part to get back to the good. Right. So you Okay. We all knew this was coming then. It went up so fast it was like, man, the the other the antithesis is gonna take over here soon. This is gonna happen. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. But now and we need to like so bad now. Yeah. Yeah. But we can't pretend like the antithesis isn't here because it's here. Okay. Well, it's here. We suck. Is that what you want me to say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, come on. If we, if we really want to produce that strong opposite reaction, we go really, really hard on the antithesis. So it's like the bounce back effect. The harder we push into how shitty it is, the better it'll bounce back. Maybe. Or, you know, everybody just uh, caves in. <laughs> or, you know, it's just. I'll start no. screaming. I'll start screaming hello on the show if that's if if you want me to start playing like the apps opposite of what I want, then I'm game. You know, I'll wear the costume. <laughs> Can we get a little sample of what that might sound like? Fuck no, never. <laughs> There's not enough okay, truly right. really on this planet. All right, uh, let's Can we get a sample. <laughs> let's shift gears here a little bit. All right, this this these next two questions are going to transition us into some total other stuff. All What's right. your favorite nineties intro? <laughs> 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 yeah. 
<laughs> Give us a list of three underrated '90s tunes. Okay. Did Manning <laughs> undervalued. <laughs> All right. Uh, Ryan Bitter says, "Now more than ever, why has the term investor in quotes become such an insult to call mm. a hobbyist?" <laughs> Oh, that's. The, I thought there was more. That's the question. Uh, I mean, should we have the context of like the different variations of what an investor means? Yeah, we could do that. Sure. I don't really want to, but I, yeah, we have to. I don't really want to. I, I think maybe the answer here is just a little bit. It's one person. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a factor. That's definitely a factor. And it's just a little more straightforward, which is like, number one, it's not cool even to an investor to wear the name tag of investor when your investments aren't investing well. I think that's a, that's a thing. Isn't investor also in other like avenues of mar other markets come with a connotation of regulation? Okay. Yeah, maybe. Uh, let me, can I use an example that I'll illustrate how we feel about this? It's like, it's like, uh, uh, it's really like your intention. So it's like if, um, if someone buys a card and says, this is my grail card, this is a fucking grave card. I'm going to be buried at this thing. I'm, I'm going to live with my grandkids are going to have this card dot, dot, dot available. <laughs> it's like, that's the investor that we're talking about. It's like, yeah, that's kind of gross, you know, versus the person who's like, I'm here. My purpose is a dealer. I, I, I fill a need in this space. I'm not here to collect the cards. I'm going to simply move cards from myself to others. I'm going to connect people. This is my job. This is the role. I don't think anyone's ever been mad at that role of the investor. I mean, I certainly am not. It's like you say you're doing it. This is who you are. You know, you're, you're open about it. Who, who can have an issue with that? It's really the, the intent of like, I'm an investor. Oh, now I'm a collector. Oh, wait, you know, I'm, I'm, this is, you're, you're touching at the heartstrings of collectors by saying one thing and then behind the scenes you're doing something else. I think that's really, it's a more specific nuance to like the thing that makes us mad. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> There's a fine point too that's kind of being touched on in the chat, which is like collecting cards, it's not really what an, what an investment is, even if the object is to profit, strictly. Uh, an investment usually deals with an item that generates value uh, independent of speculation. Mm -hmm. there's, there's usually like fundamentals related to revenue streams that can be generated right. that dividends. Like an investment. A, a card falls more into the category of speculation mm -hmm. of the belief that the value will increase, not because it's a business that can generate more revenue, but because it will become more desired over time. Yes. There's a bit of a difference there. Okay. And this one from the Konomi card, bring in the spice. I had, a, I had some people take, a, take umbrage to this when I shared it to my story on our behalf. Very nice of them. The Konomi card <laughs> says, why does Card Ladder claim to be for the quote unquote collectors when it's clear Clearly a tool, clearly, built for quote unquote investors. So we were too mean to investors, now we're too mean to collectors? I don't know. I don't know, I don't know man. What do you say? What is it? Card letter is clearly a tool built for investors. So <laughs> how can it claim to be for the collectors? Man, that's a, that's a, you, this is the part of the show where I realize you don't filter questions to make this easier on us, do you? You sit there and hammering me with the tough ones let's go what fun is it if we don't <laughs> no i agree i just uh i don't know man but, i mean even as a collector the the shit ain't free we're not just like swapping around digital pictures oh that's not free either apparently those are millions of dollars no it's like this stuff costs money and even as a collector you need to know the market more exactly. participate in it you need to. exactly yeah and i you know um language is difficult that's a point that gets overlooked a lot but as i've taken a curious look at artificial intelligence 
uh, it, it has revealed that language is really, really difficult. It's so imprecise from the way that sentences are structured to the meaning of words in different contexts. It's really difficult. Language is tough. I think like that's one of the problems that we stumble into here is that what a collector means to one person is a different than what it means to another and what investor means to one person it's different that it means to another you can get more technical you can get more casual with these you you can have lay uses of these words you can have very proper uses of these words i think a lot of it gets lost in that um here's the here's the deal card ladder is a tool <laughs> i've always felt weird calling it a tool card ladder is a software application that can be used by a lot of different people for a lot of different purposes. But I think the question of what is, who was it built for? What was it built for? It was built by us to give us access to resources that we use when we collect cards. <laughs> okay? And that's why like certain features have become the center of card ladder that weren't the center at the start because mm -hmm. that's how users, which I think the vast majority are really more collector oriented. That's where they've skewed towards. That's, that's the needs that, and, and the main need, the main function, the main thing that people are trying to do is figure out what the hell is a fair price to pay for a card that they want to buy. That's it. I mean, the whole project was born out of you trying to figure out how much to pay for Michael Jordan cards. Right. You know, it was like, here's what they sold for last time. Here's what they sold for two times ago at a PWCC auction. <laughs> what can I reasonably expect this third time? Right. And what, how much money should I get ready? Should I sell something else to prepare for this upcoming auction? Given the trends, should I, I mean, it was really born out of that simple idea. And then it's turned, it's morphed into like, as we added more customers and we added more, people into the space that were excited about using it for their reasons and that weren't our reasons, we've evolved the tool to sort of like fit everybody. And now it's, now it's become this total power user tool where, you know, you can kind of like mold it to your own, however you want. Yeah, there's like sections of the app that could be used for purpose, you know, hundred percent flipping investor purposes with like, you know, you're setting in the, quantity you have, the price you paid for each, the profit margins, all that stuff. Like you could use it that way, or you could use it to strictly shop, like set your save searches and trying to add to your P like, you know, it, it kind of becomes whatever you want it to be. I want to tell you, and then I want you to tell me your five most frequent actions as a card hmm. user, not, not somebody, not as the builder, but as a user <laughs> to me as a user, the five things I do most every morning I go to dashboard and watch my collection go down another percent because I have my collection right there and I just see that 1% go down. Yep. Peer over the balcony. <laughs> now you're higher balcony. You, you peer a little bit further up. Right. And, I, and I do that because uh, I like pain and misery and I hate myself and I just confirms everything that I thought. Uh, That's nice. Also, um, the next thing I do is I will usually go to um, one of either showcase or shop or indexes. Those are the next three that I go to. I like to go to showcase. I don't go like every day, but I like to go and just see how many cards have been uploaded since I uploaded my last? I'll scroll mm. until I get to the last one I upload. I just like to see like how many people are just, because there's nothing to really gain from putting your card in a showcase, except to just show it to people. You except know? the community, like, like being just like willing to do it. Yes, just, just that little thing of like wanting to share your card with people. And so I, and I, so I love to see what people are showing and sharing and letting other people see. Uh, I like to look at the indexes again for pain and I like to look at shop because I have some safe searches and I like, it's a great way to see if something that I want 
is coming up. It's, it's such a cleaner interface than any auction house. I know that sounds like I'm just patting us on the back, but it, it really is. So I like to go to shop and then from there, you know, I'm off to a research project. I'm, maybe I'm going to sales history to look up stuff, find a, what a card sold for to try to price something. Maybe I'm just interested in it, but and then I just start going down rabbit holes. What about you? What are the main use cases for you? Oh, I, I'll, I'll also like click on collection at least once a day. Yeah. Just look at all the scans. Right? Yeah, you almost missed that one. Phew. Uh, I go to shop first and I hit all my save searches. And I check to see what's available. I hit that probably five times a day. Wow. I do eBay after because I get less hits from eBay now than I do from my shop. Because like PWCC Weekly, Golden Weekly, and Heritage, those have more hits on the stuff I like than eBay does now. I get like five new eBay sales searches a day. And then I go to sales history and I search things that I enjoy and I filter by lowest price of a thousand. I like to see what's sold for a lot. It's interesting to see how many cards sell for more than a thousand dollars every day. You could just sort by date sold, put a min price of a thousand and just start scrolling different. You can search players and be like, wow, I didn't know that a Dirk Nowinski's card sold for two grand yesterday. It happens a lot more than you think. And then I go to collection and just look through like the grid view. So I just do the grid and look at all the pictures and do it that way. See what I've been decimated on that day. Like you. <laughs> Yeah. And then, then well, those are my big three. I don't go to showcase that much. I don't know why. I do. I go to showcase like what, every few days, and then I'll do, do dashboard to see the. I like to look at your ladder headline, so I go to dashboard for that to like see what was what happened yesterday in the market, and then I'll after every major auction I will. Filter by a platform of that auction, min date the day before today, sort by price, and I can see all the golden sales from one night sorted by price or PWCC. Yes. I like to do that and just like yes. scroll through and just see everything that's sold. That's the one I forgot to mention. I do that too. After every big auction, I, I just sort by highest and I just using this, excuse me, using the same filter that you mentioned, I just look at, I go from top, I go from top to bottom. I go, I look at everything. It's, it can be super eye -opening. And you can do the same thing with shop where you go shop platform, golden or PWCC, whenever they launch a new one, remove the search and just, and then sort by recently added and just look at everything that's been like the newest auction. Yep. When PWCC premiere launches, I just go to our site first and I just start looking through it. Yep. <laughs> Little hack there. Okay. Uh, Cajun Cardboard says. I saw this one. You like this one? I do not like this one. Okay, let's go. He says, I hate consolidation. By the way, happy birthday, Cajun Cardboard. <laughs> uh, he goes, I hate consolidation. Am I the only one? Please discuss those of us that actually want more slabs, not less. <sighs> um. Nah, dog. That's a nah for me. <laughs> You want some airtime on this? Get your airtime on your own show, buddy. <laughs> this is my show. Uh, yeah. I don't know. We gave we gave a platform to the question. We gave a platform to the question. How about that? I don't know. Happy birthday, Brian. I my favorite part of my hobby experience is when I feel like I'm getting cards that I shouldn't be qualified to get. <laughs> What do you mean by that? Then I, I like uh, my favorite part of collecting. The thing that makes me get up two hours early because I'm just like pumped is chasing a card that a person of my means and station in life should not <laughs> own. All right, and so honestly, like consult anti consult, like having a bunch of slabs. I, I can completely understand the collector advantage of like enjoying having so much nice, a, a plethora of things to look at and enjoy. I get it. I do. But for me as a collector, the thing that I know really gets my juices going is when I'm actually like scrambling to sell everything 
because there's like, <laughs> like a chance at that mythical, incredible card that, you know, should be out of my grasp. So like there's all that, that's, that process always leads to like whittling down the collection. When I got to Vegas, you guys are already there. And I went to your room and there was a big box of like 2000 cards. And I looked at those cards and I looked at you and I was like, what? This doesn't, that doesn't even like, these cards don't even, right, right. didn't even compute. Like these cards don't even look like you. They don't even make any sense. And you're like, oh, I'm trying to get rid of all those to get one card. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like I'm talking to Coleman. I'm trying to trade every single one of these for one card today. We're going to make it happen. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's like the ultimate consolidation. That's a great uh, hobby cautionary tale was uh, grading a bunch of stuff in late 2020, spending like 25 grand to just grade a boatload of cards that for the most part, it'll be nice if I get half of my money back when it's all said and done, just a grading fee. So, yeah. But yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. I, I just look at that as lesson learned, right? Okay. At least you got the cards back quickly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, two years. Was, uh... There was cards. I mean, it's like a rundown memory lane looking through that. You're like, wow, look at that. Uh, you know, deer and fox. I bet that would have been valuable. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, Mike Pinkerton 50 says, is there anyone you started collecting that you don't collect anymore? Mm, Mikhail Bridges is dead to me. Ooh, okay. Yeah, I started collecting Hakeem. That was like, I had a little experiment at the very beginning where I had like 10 Hakeem slabs in the very, very beginning. And then I said, no, I want, I want to do Jordan instead. But maybe one day I go back. Um, ben... Cross Country Runner 1 says the term mega bid was coined on this show. Can you or the chat, shout out to Pat Nicholson for that. He goes, can you or the chat think of a term for people who don't care about cards and list them at 10x comps all day? <laughs> now we're like on the hook for coming up with awesome terms on the spot. All right. <laughs> yeah, come on. This is easy, right? <laughs> Uh, no, it's not easy. The anti-Drake, uh, the, anti the Drake's antagonists. <laughs> <laughs> is there a Drake in a movie where he's a hero and the bat the villain is like a name? Uh, yes, the villain to Drake's what hero. The show Josh and Drake, is there a bad guy in that show? <laughs> I don't know, is there? Like someone's named Kyle, something like that. <laughs> Okay. All right. I think it was the sister. Wasn't Megan the villain in Josh and Drake? I have no idea. I didn't even know that was a show. I thought that was like a weird thing. <laughs> like a weird what? Just finish that I sentence. I thought you were just like coming up with some like concept on the fly. No, that's a show. Okay. I did not know that. All right. Well. It was All right. Well, Mr. Big Show. Mr. Big Shot Succession, you're like, what show is that? Garbage. I only watch the best of the best. Think about it. Is this show really worth interrupting my rewatch of season one, episode five? Because uh, you're, back. Wasn't. you're back. Wait, you're halfway through season one again? Yeah, I'm probably about in episode five or six. This time last week, you were on like season two for the first time. <laughs> well, first of all, I had to like make up a lot of time, right? Because... I yeah. had to get there before the finale, but yeah, now I'm just, okay, but yeah, let's not, I want to rapid fire through some of these last questions so we get there a few. Go. All right, Pack Nicholson, who was just referenced, says, has anyone ever stated that a card is overgraded when they list it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm always seeing the good Samaritans say undergraded, and I feel like it's nice that they're looking out for me by telling me that the professional grader was wrong. And I should just trust their opinion instead. However, I'm starting to think that those people might actually be lying in order <laughs> to sell me the card and that they're actually looking out for themselves and not me. Does this hobby value honesty? 
if I list a card and I say it's a PSA 10, but it looks worse, it could cross the BGS 8.5. Do you think that will help or hurt my listing? <laughs> uh, I, what is, what's Pack Nicholson's name again? I forget his name. Pack. Pack Nicholson. Uh, he seems like a fun guy to hang out with. That's, that's some solid sense of humor right there. He's got the, uh, you know, the sarcasm going. He's got the good Samaritan joke. And then he says, I feel like maybe, maybe they were lying. It's, it's good. That's good comedy. You remember hanging out with him at, in New York? Yeah, okay. Yeah. He was just like firing off, off the funny stuff. And he's got the Jay Cutler cards. I love it. the Jay Cutler PC and it all fits. Pack Nicholson. Nice package there when you put it all together. That's just... All right. So that, that's not he doesn't even want to answer that question he just wants to shine in the moment of having a really funny paragraph exactly we like, like that we platform funny paragraphs all right Bruin Killer says with the NBA playoffs ending soon uh, unfortunate what what is the plan for the summer other than the Nationals and I told him that there's no S on there it's just Nationals <laughs> And, and, he's, and he he doesn't accept the correction. He pushes back and he says, well, it's multiple days. So, all right. Other than the National, what is your summer plan, Josh? Oh, man. I've seen people in my DMs that call it Nationals that I'm like, dude, you've been in the hobby for 10 years. That's not good. How are you? You seem like someone that should know it's called National. How dare you, sir? Uh, but I usually don't say that. I just let it go. What am I going to do during the summer? Like stay inside and avoid dying from melting in the sun? Yeah, that's, that's a good thing to do. Collect cards, buy LeBrons. Right. Yep, th those are good hobbies. Watch baseball. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm not doing that. <laughs> well, maybe if I need to take a nap, I can put on a baseball game. <laughs> well, that's, that nap is now shorter, sir. It's only a two-hour nap now, I'm told. So have fun True. with that. True, true. Yeah, no, I just can't wait to see everybody at the NSCC Collector Convention Nationals. And uh, other than that, maybe the, maybe a Dallas show. Like, we will be going to the Dallas show in July. Yep. So I, need to go, cool. I need to go to a Burbank show. You down? Maybe so. Possibly. I've, I'm always down for an excuse to get to Southern California. It's nice over there, I'm told. The weather is decent. All right. Uh, Perimeter Collectibles says, what part is more fun, the hunting or the gathering? Mm. <laughs> the gathering being like, you have it? I guess. Maybe the gathering is like enjoying the collection and, you know, surveying it and uh, figure out what you want to add and remove and stuff. I think the answer is hunting, but I like... Uh... I like both, so I don't know. I'd probably say hunting, I guess. Yes. Hunting is more fun, but don't sleep on gathering. Don't gathering sleep. Decent as well. Hunting provides the high and then the crash when it's all over, but the gathering is steady. When I, when I, these came in the mail, like before I opened them, I'm like, <sighs> I've, the, you know what I mean? It's like, it's not ever going to live up to the hype that I've built up in my head. I'm going to open them and be like, yeah, but it's not, you know, I'm not going to like flow to the skip to the moon or something like, you know, I'm just opening the package. Right. Yep. I mean, look, not to get too hyper realistic here, but by the time it gets there in the mail, the, uh, it's already down. It's already started going downhill. The peak, the peak, peak, is when it's in the mail. Yep. And then like, like a few months later, it's fun when you haven't looked at it in a while and you bust it out. That's a good moment. Yeah. When it, if it, if it uh, fits into the PC and it's a good fit, you go back to that well of happiness and bring out all the cards and it really is working, you know? That's, yeah. That's a very like, different but great satisfaction as well. I like looking at them all in my card letter collection grid view. Totally. They all line up nicely. They're ordered the way I want them ordered. It looks nice. Grid view. Grid view or you're a noob. All right. 
or you just or you just vault all your cards and you look at your vault account. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, let's see. Let's make sure that I can just get to a few more here. Oh, the meme James had a great question. I should have got to this earlier. Gonna be super positive and upbeat, right? Yes. He says, "Do you think that Bang Bros cards make excellent <laughs> long-term investments?" Is that real? Sort of. There was a lawsuit surrounding them by Panini because they were infringing Panini's marks. But okay. the, last I, the last I heard about that lawsuit was that they sued the wrong people, that it's not Bang Bros, the company who's making these, it's somebody else who's making mm. these. And I don't know if they know who's making them. But the, the, the short answer to the question is uh, yes, they do. Because when I see a Lameem James image, about a 50% shot that he just completely photoshopped the whole thing and I don't even know what I'm looking at. Yep. Fair. Fair. Few understand this. He Few posted that recently and I'm like, he might have just made that today. I don't even, is that even real? No, you are right to cast a skeptical gaze upon the memes productions. Okay, Cam Reddish, all right, he had a very sloppy autograph, but it wasn't no damn lie. All right. It, he shaved some stuff off I'm that photo. I'm the lid off of that one. <laughs> He's oh, done it to somebody else. <laughs> He's sitting there like erasing parts of their autograph to make it look like it's just a, a single line. Yeah, and he did it to somebody else recently as well. Wow. Buyer beware. Uh, all right. Um, there's some long ones here. Oh, you you, so re glad. you replied to this one and you said good question. Good topic. Oh, yeah. The Bachelor. Nope, not that one. But do you want to do that one? I mean, do both. Do the other one first. You are, I know what you're talking about now. Okay. PLB Cards says, last week there was a card letter blog, parentheses by our great blog author, which stated, there are two distinct types of people in the hobby, those who collect cards for the love and appreciate sentimental value, and those who view them as mere commodities to be bought and sold for profit. End quote. Why do so many in the hobby insist on labeling themselves and others as collectors or investors when so few fit neatly into either box? Josh, you, even admitted to flipping cards that he bought. Well, it. Sure. How dare you? Does that mean he isn't a collector and that he doesn't appreciate cards what they are? I get that we want to root out dishonest people and shameless pumping can be annoying or worse, but beyond that, shouldn't people be able to enjoy the hobby however they want without being labeled? I mean, yeah, of course. Everything he said is right. I'm not disagreeing with any of it. Yeah, this just comes back to that language point from earlier. But yeah, mm. I get the point being made, but I also totally get the point being made by the blog as well, which is that uh, there are people of different intents, and that's okay. That's all right it's to uh, classify and categorize things from time to time. It's... It's kind of how the brain and logic work. But I point well taken from the uh, comments. Okay. Uh, where is this question? About the guilty, the guilty pleasure. Oh, let me, we always have to read Vinny's slide. Oh, okay, here it is. Never, I found it. We'll go to that, then we'll go to Vinny. AP Cards 23 says, you guys do a good job considering and answering questions on the show. Wow. Considering what? How stupid we are? <laughs> yeah. It's like it's a miracle you, you two even get through a show with your mumbling words and your all brains. You guys do a great job of putting a few words together and not completely <laughs> putting me to sleep. And, you, and, you go, and he says, and you've talked in the past about feeling like you have given responsible answers given the wide audience. But what I want to know is do you have any secret hobby loves that you are embarrassed about that you would not recommend that you would not recommend okay like how dudes sometimes secretly love a trashy reality show but they never admit to it could be a crappy unpopular product it could be a worthless high population card that you love but doesn't fit with being a collector a super collector or even if it's secretly enjoying the drama in the hobby for its entertainment value, what is your, your real housewives of the hobby? Well, 
I think that, that that's the old price himself once said that I don't know anything about football because I collect Todd Gurley cards. So I guess that would be my, uh, I you know, you know, do as I do as I say. Don't what is that stupid phrase? Do as I do. Don't I don't know what it is. Don't follow what I'm. I, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, can't get fooled again. That's a, yeah. You know it. Thank you. So I don't know anything about football because I collect people that are running backs and that's bad value. Yeah. Uh, so you're just throwing your entire Todd Gurley collection in here. Boom. <laughs> nice. Uh, I don't know. This is a hard question for me to answer because I really don't operate with a lot of shame. So there's probably, similar to your answer, there's probably lots of things that I do that most people would be embarrassed to admit. You watch Circle. Well, yeah. Oh, that's just... It's like the... This is this, like Josh's answer perplexed me as well because it's like he's not actually asking you. You guys both just like want to admit your actual guilty pleasure. Just do it. What's no. your What's your guilty pleasure TV show? I don't. I already posted it. You You said uh, The Bachelor. Yeah, my wife and I watch it still, like to this day. Uh, and I uh, I know Stiff Arm Wax loves to point out that his he doesn't love to point it out. His is uh, the challenge, the road rule, uh, real road road rules challenge. He still watches that. It's still going? It's still, still going? Yeah, I believe it is still going. I used to love that show when I was a teenager. Yeah. Yeah, all those MTV shows, right? I, my, my wife and I just love watching it, not having to think, and we just make fun of everybody on the show. You don't, you don't have a soft spot for anyone? No, Bachelor. We just watch it and make fun of everybody. They're all so stupid. <laughs> I don't know if that really Wait. counts then, you know, like. But we still watch it. Like, we still waste hours and hours of our lives watching this ridiculous show. Yeah, they hate watching it. That's the thing. Yeah, it is, but it's not, it's not like, it's not like you're gen- it's not like you're crying at the end, you know, when the Bachelor is- <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah, because they never stay together, ever. <laughs> yeah. The show has a hit rate of, like, 1%. All right. Well, fair enough. You cry at the end of the circle, like, oh my god, Becky, she tricked them all and told them she was someone else. Oh my god, it's so amazing. It's heartwarming. No, I can't say that I do, but I don't hate watching it. Do you know what the circle is? I've seen season one, yeah. You've seen season is. one? Oh shit, okay. Every time Netflix I go into Netflix, they've got a show way up at top by itself and it's like you want to watch this i know you you fuck, click this thing i usually do because i'm like yeah you guys are usually right i watch it so i give it a chance i watch the season and i see what happens <laughs> all right shit. but you didn't make it to season two huh um no it's all right i mean i get it like you can either be yourself or you can be someone else and you just social media game them and i get it interesting content my wife likes the uh the one where they date each other but they can't see each other the blind, uh, love is blind. She likes that one. Nice. Okay. Uh, I I have to get to Vinny Slabberino before we end. Wasn't that a show like, wait, wasn't that a show like in the 50s though? Like where you like matchmaking? But they have to, they like engage and stuff. They get like engaged without seeing each other. It's, it's. Okay, never mind. Yeah, it's a little much. All right. Let me get to Vinny really quick here. Vinny says, always enjoy the show. I recently read a book on coin collecting and concluded that cards have copied everything from coins. They even coined the phrase, buy the coin, not the slab, in 1986. All right, is this Jeff? Were they called slabs back then? He says... uh, (laughs) There was also, and this is like the point of the question here, there was an NGO, a non-governmental organization that actively prosecuted fraudulent activity, fake coins, fake slabs, refurbished coins, and even unfair pricing. It was funded by individual dealers and collectors with the belief that prices go up in a more trusted market. Do you think this idea could work in the card hobby? Who would be incentivized? incentivized to fund it. Do you think card prices would be impacted? Thanks, Vinny. Do you remember when I had um, 
Brent from PWCC on Cardboard Chronicles. He was talking about coins a lot. He he was drawing the parallel. That was the first and last time I've ever heard that parallel. He was basically saying like coins were a much bigger market than cards, and he was hoping that the future of cards got to the point of coins. So that's interesting that Vinny kind of noted the same thing. I don't have any opinion on the other part of the question. I get nervous when there's talk about forming bodies that will have power that can determine and make judgments and enforce stuff. Whether it's governmental, whether it's non-governmental, whether it's whatever, like as soon as that power source becomes available, I just, I start worrying about how people are gonna abuse it. And uh, I get the point here and I get the need and the insistence on wanting to regulate behaviors, the shady BS behaviors that people pull off and get away with and keep getting away with. I totally understand the need and the want to do that, but I think there's a real concern that the grass is not, not always greener and then what happens if we end up creating entities like this and the people that come to power and the people that take them over are the same people, at least in some measure, who are the ones who are pulling off the shadiness and the BS now because that often happens. Yeah. That's my biggest fear is that, that influencers are the ones that are going to have the most influence at Fanatics and our future is like breaking in influencers with Fanatics. That's my biggest fear. It's like, this is what you wanted. We wanted this uh, company that's going to listen to the people, but they listen to the people we don't like. Great, thanks. Indeed. Did you have a point here, Christina? I was going to say, like, every government in the history of the world. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. What'd she say? Well, she said uh, she was saying this will be the way that every government in the history of the world goes. Corruption. Corruption. All right. I think Great that's value. it. She's a Ray Dalio girl. <laughs> yeah. What? She is an off the grid doomsday prepper. Yeah. 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 In, in Dallas, Texas, in a high rise. Yep, that's me. <laughs> and then she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, and it's, he's saying it's like following all the traditional patterns. And it, it ends up being with like corruption and greed, you know, like same kind of stuff. Yeah, I don't think we have any shortage of those things. Nope. Dude, what do you think it means for our card values if uh, the United States crumbles as an empire? <laughs> if the United States is worth half as much, what's my green PMG worth? Right, exactly. Exactly. Will we be the real... That will we have the last semblance of wealth when the dollar is worth nothing, but we can trade on fractionalized slabs? <laughs> All right, we're in hour three, so now I can ask you whatever I want. Rate succession as your all-time show. Where does it go? <sighs> Let me complete the rewatch okay. because all of my favorite shows I have rewatched. You know, on the rewatch... First of all, uh, so many more things make sense because like I've, it, the world of this show is so unusual that like it takes a season or two to come to terms with yeah. it and to understand what normal is in that world. Thanks. Yeah, and now that I know what normal is, but I also like, there are plot hole, not plot holes, there are untied threads that like they started in the first season and there's sort of things that happen that like may develop the character, but they're otherwise aimless ultimately yep. in the grand scheme of the show. That's like a little bit, now that I know where the show ends, it's just like, hey, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in here that didn't need to be here. But like, I get it. Like the first five episodes, they didn't know where they were going. You know, like, yeah. where, where do you rank? Number one. Okay. Bold. I'm a pres prisoner of the moment. Uh, that seems like it might be fair. What do you have number two? Uh, well, first of all, I always separate drama and comedy. I don't think it's fair to try to, to like, try to compare Bill Russell to Steve Nash 
or what does he say? He's like, so who is he saying is better than Bill Russell? Someone that's like, he's like Stromile Swift's basically Bill Russell, but he just played in the, remember that? <laughs> uh, no, drama and comedy. So I go office number one for comedy and succession number one for drama and breaking bad number two for drama and probably parks and rec number two for comedy. All right. That works. That works. Yeah. I don't know. I'll, I have to complete the rewatch, but like, I love the world that it creates, but I'll tell you this, like, uh, episodes with Logan at the center and with Logan in tension with the various characters, that, that is when the show is at its peak. I will say that. His, his dynamic is the, the key to that show. So, but I don't want to like get into spoilers, so I'll just, I should just stop there. All right. He has a lot of gra- gravity as a character. Do you want to take a stab at Rookie Patch Auto's question? Who is the Logan Roy, the Connor no. Roy, and the... No, Roy? absolutely not. No. Absolutely. I would just ruin the show. Yeah, that's uh, that's gonna hurt a lot of feelings, and it it's tough. And they're all horrible people, also. So I couldn't even think of a Logan Roy. I'm like, I, I like I love James Beckett. I would never do. I would never put Doctor Beckett as any one of these characters. Like, oh, he's you know, he's got the prestige. He's like been around a long time. It's like, God, Logan Roy is like a terrible person. No way, I'm not doing that to Doctor Beckett. Right, fair, fair, fair. All right, let's... love Roman. Roman, <laughs> what is that? Episode four, where he makes his or episode two, where he is like, I don't know if anyone in the hobby is doing that kind of stuff. No, you know, <laughs> yeah, you don't, you don't want to be the Roman Roy of the hobby. No. And Kendall, no. Let, Bad. Let us pick a title for this show. Okay. Read them out. Uh. Duct tape over my butt cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I was waiting for that to be the first one. Boom. Why are you still here? Uh, JCKN it, which looks like Jack in it. <laughs> Ain't no fun yeah. being down 80%. That, that's a good title. Yeah. I that, like that, that. Kind of sums, that kind of sums up the night. Yeah, it does. Uh, the only other ones I had was what inning? What in What inning is the crash? Everything's got it. Got an inning. And Hegelian dialectic, which uh, we should not do. That we will get a, a totally different type of audience coming in and listening that we don't want. So read the read the winner again. Ain't no fun being down eighty percent. That came from the chat, right? Yeah, it came from Lemmy. Oh, maybe we should pick something else. So. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one because it kind of like a, has a playful joke about the topic of the night right yep I like it but I think he's being earnest I think he was talking about his tray on collection 80% you sh- were we sure it's that it's that friendly <laughs> wow alright nice let's uh, you let's get your make me laugh on I said Vic you're gonna get, what was that one what's that you were supposed to take a victory lap on, on something. I, I messaged you. I was like, take your victory lap. I don't know. You got a question on a story, and I replied to the story to your DMs, and I said, victory lap, what was it? Speaking of Trey Young. Uh, I don't know. There's so many victory laps to take that uh, can't keep them all straight. I don't know. <laughs> Good answer. We're going to all go look at the DMs. We'll get it next week. All right. See you guys. We're reaching the top. A lot has changed since Card Ladder began. We started with 500 cards in our database, and now we have over 3 million cards and over 30 million sales. For anyone asking who is the best, we put in our hands up. With Card Ladder's sales history feature, we have virtually every card in our system. If the card you are looking for ever sold on one of these platforms, you can find it using Card Ladder's sales history. And you can add a card to your collection with just one click. My time, my time. None of you people can tell me to stop. Plus, every card, no matter the last time it sold, has an estimated value that we calculated using our state-of-the-art player indexes. 
Unlike other apps, when you see Card Ladder's Verify checkmark, that means a researcher personally vetted each and every sale. We know what it takes to be reaching the top! We know what you want, because Card Ladder was created by collectors for collectors. We know what it takes to be reaching the top! Join the innovators, not the imitators. Card Ladder 2.0, constantly innovating. Try it for free. See why Card Ladder is the industry leader in sports card data. We know what it takes to be reaching the top! Card Ladder 2.0.